uh, what did I call it? 2D rigid bodies, 2D statics. Two D rigid body statics. Yeah, we just went over all the two D joints, and we did one example, I think, at the end. Okay, so this is what we've been talking about, and I'm just going to do a couple more examples uh, before we go on to three dimensional stuff. Well, I guess yeah. We still have a little to do before I go on to three-dimensional, but first I want to do two more examples. So the first example, uh, let's say that there's a wall over here, and a cantilever beam coming out of the wall at an angle. Let's say this angle is... 50 degrees, and a cable comes from the end up and goes over a pulley, and attached to that cable is a 200 kilogram mass. Wow, that's big. You guys who just came in, remind me before you leave, I have your tests, okay? Um, and the length of this beam is two meters. And the mass is 30 kilograms. That's the mass of the beam. And we want to know what are the reaction forces, what are the reaction loads at the wall. Um, okay, so doing these problems right, the biggest part of it is just knowing how to treat the joints. And to sort of jog your memories on that, I know it's been a while since the last class, but uh, the way you think through what loads are applied to by a joint are you think about what degrees of freedom are removed by the joint. Does the joint remove translation along the x-axis, translation along the y-axis, rotation? Those are the only three degrees of freedom in two-dimensional problems. Uh, this, this is a fixed joint, so it's like welded to, the, to that wall or whatever. So um, let's draw, well, we're going to do two free body diagrams. Uh, so first over here is the free body diagram for the 200 kilogram mass. And then over here is the free body diagram for the beam. Um, And why don't you take a second and with each of these, uh, try to draw the free body diagram. Um, maybe do it in a light, you know, light pencil or something so you can correct it or else just draw a new one when, when I go through it. But see if you can. So first, the 200 kilogram mass. There's a weight. That's 200 times 9.81. So. 1,962. 
And then the force at the top is applied by a cable. So it has to be parallel to the cable away from the body. And for now, I'll just call that force T. And now a free body diagram of the beam. There's a force from the cable over here. That's the same cable that's applied to the box, so I'll call that T. Then there's a weight. Uh, where does the weight act? The middle, yep, center of mass. Um, so that's 30 times 9.81, so 294.3 newtons. Um, that fixed joint eliminates all degrees of freedom. No translation can happen, no rotation. And so that means that there is an X and a Y component of a force. And there's a couple, uh, instead of F, I'll call this R for reaction. Uh, it doesn't, it's just the variable name. And then I'll call this MR for reaction moment. Um, when do you have to draw a free body diagram? Sometimes on quizzes I say that and people say always, but like I don't expect you to just steadily walk around in your life drawing free body diagrams. Yeah, so anytime you're using Newton's laws, that's Newton's second law and also the rotational, the moment equation. Uh, that's when you need a free body diagram. So the reason we did these two free body diagrams is that we're going to use Newton's laws for each of them. This one, uh, it's not going to, the moment equation isn't going to help us. This is, this, we don't know anything about the rotation or anything. So Newton's second law is going to be enough to calculate that T. Um, so Newton's second law, and let's use a coordinate system one we usually use with x to the right, y up. Newton's second law says 0t plus 0, negative 1962 is equal to 0, 0. Um, The x equation doesn't help, but the y equation tells us that t is equal to positive 1962. And so now we can take that information and put it over there. And now Newton's second law. Oh, uh, for this one, we're going to, this is a rigid body. We are going to use the moment equation. So I'm going to use that organization method. I'm going to list out the row vector and the force and the moment for each of these loads. The first force is from the cable. Uh, we have to choose an about point. Uh, I'm going to put the about point here because that's where we have the most unknown forces. So what's the row vector from, or how are we going to calculate the row vector to get from the about point to where that force T is applied? Yeah, so let's see. We have, so here's our coordinate system. The vector we want has a tail here and a head here, right? And so we want the tail of the vector at the origin. And now my thumb is the x-axis. So to get from my thumb, the x-axis, to here, we go 90, 180, 270, minus 50, so 220. Any questions about that? Um, and the length is 2, so it's cos 2 times the cosine and sine of 220. Uh, is negative 1.53 um, negative 
Does it make sense that those are both negative? Yeah, because that vector is in the third quadrant. Uh, one thing that I'm doing this time, this is just short, sort of a short um, When I filled this out up until now, I've written all three components of all these vectors, right? Because when, when you're doing stuff in the plane, you only have x and y components of the forces, and then you take the cross product, and you always get only a z component, okay? So if you're only going to get a z component, there's no reason that, you know, it doesn't really help to write down the 0 for x and the 0 for y. So in 2D, I'm just going to start writing these as two-dimensional vectors and this as a scalar. But remember that a moment is really always a vector. And if you're in the xy plane, it's a vector parallel to z. Okay, remember that. That's, uh, that's going to be on a quiz probably. Okay, so uh, the first vector is in the positive y direction uh, with a magnitude of 1962. So the force is zero, positive 1962. Cross product is negative 3002. So to take the cross product, now what we're doing is just this times this minus this times this. So negative 1.53 times 1962 is negative 3002. Those are zero. Uh, that was my tablet that made that noise. Uh, okay, next force is the weight. Um, what's, what are the components of that vector? So it's going to be this time 1 times cosine and sine of 220, or if you notice that uh, it's just going to be half of the vector to here, you just divide those both in 2. So you get negative 0 0.76. A negative 0 0.65. The force vector is 0, negative 294.3. And take this cross product, this times this, minus this times this, you get 745. Okay, let's take a break on that for a second. Does it make sense that um, does it make sense that the moment produced by T is negative? And how do you how do you uh, sanity check that one? Sign. You so. Our axis of rotation is this. So you imagine this thing free to rotate about that point A. And then you imagine which way it would rotate if you applied a force like that. So take a little, so this is free to rotate, except around that point, give it a little tap like that, bing, it would rotate clockwise, so that's negative. Yep. That doesn't make any sense, does it? What do you get? <laughs> oh, okay, yes. Because in my problem here, I have a different mass for the B. Thank you. Okay, so what do you get? 223.7. Okay. And does it make sense that this moment is positive? Yeah, because, again, if it's free to rotate right here, and you apply a force down, give a little tap, it would make it rotate counterclockwise, which is positive. And does it make sense that this one has a lot bigger magnitude than this? Yes, because the moment arm is bigger, and the force is bigger.
And now we have the reaction force R. What's the row vector for that reaction force? Zero, yep. And the force vector is Rx, Ry, and so the cross product is zero. And then we have the reaction moment, MR. Um, that's a couple. And with couples, the force and the row vector don't mean anything. All that matters is the couple itself, so I'll call that MR here. So now I'll go to Newton's second law, and that says 0, 1962 plus 0, negative 294.3 plus Rx, Ry is equal to zeros. You can't always. Uh, solve that by itself. Sometimes you have to solve it as a system of equations, but this one you can. And you get R is equal to uh, 294.3 minus 1962. Okay, uh, so zero, and then it's negative 16. 60, 1667.7. Well, so once I, once I solve for our y. Okay. And then the moment equation says negative 3002 plus 223.7 plus MR is equal to zero. So MR is equal to, can you calculate that one? 3002 minus 223.7. Okay. This one's in newtons, the force, and the couple is newton meters. And then those loads would be what you would use to figure out how that attachment needs to be made. Uh, you know, what kind of what kind of weld you need to do or something like that to make sure that this isn't going to fail. Any questions about that? Okay. Yes. Oh, uh, yes. So um, you're talking about the uh, yeah reduced row echelon for solving the system. Yeah. Um, yes, I am very soon going to talk about how to do that in your calculators. Because with three equations, solving by substitution usually isn't too bad. But uh, when you go up to six equations, that's, it's quite, quite a bit worse. So yes. Okay, here's another example. So let's say that we have this beam. It's horizontal. And it's connected by a pin and slot joint to 
to this other thing. Okay. Um, that's supposed to be at the midpoint. The midpoint of the beam. Uh, this angle is 45 degrees. So it's 45 degrees to the slot also. That's what matters. The mass of the beam is 50 kilograms. Um, there is a downward force of 10,000 newtons at the end. And let's say the length of the beam is two meters again. And we want to know what are all the external loads acting on the beam. Can everyone picture what I have in mind in this problem? Okay, well, uh, start out with a free body diagram of the beam. So there's the beam. Uh, and take a couple minutes before I start doing this and see if you can draw a free body diagram of, uh, you know, based on what we know about these joints. At the pin joint on the left, what kind of load is applied? Yeah, all translation is stopped by this pin joint. And so there's an X and Y component of the force. So I'll call that RA, force vector. Doesn't, uh, it doesn't limit translation at all. And I want to just, and then, uh, I'm going to draw this reference in here. There's the slot. Um, what kind of load is applied by that pin and slot joint? It's translational, and this time it's in only one direction. It's not because... If all you had was this unit slot point, you could translate it along that line, right? And you could rotate it. The only thing you can't do is move perpendicular to that slot. And so it applies a force perpendicular to that slot. So I'll draw it like this. No. where this is perpendicular to the slot. And I'll call that force RB. Mm, RBs. I'm thinking RBs. That used to be a commercial. Don't go to RBs, it's terrible. Um, that wasn't part of the commercial. <laughs> That'd be a good idea though to have like reverse psychology commercials. Um, Any questions about the free body diagram? That's it. So we're going to have to choose an about point. We might as well choose this one. As always, it doesn't matter where you choose it, but uh, that might simplify some of the math. And then row, force, moment. Okay, so first, this force RA. Uh, the 
the row vector is 0. The force vector is R, A, X, R, A, Y. And the cross product is 0. Next is the weight force. The row vector goes from the red dot, the about point, to where the weight is applied. Um, so that is 1, 0. The force vector is 0, negative 490.5. The cross product is 1 times negative 490.5 minus 0 times 0, so negative 490.5. Does it make sense that that's negative? Yes? Okay. Um, because If you imagine this just being a pin that's going through the air and just sticking into that slot, you can twirl this like a pinwheel around that pin. Uh, it would be possible to make a joint that did restrict that rotation. You know, if you imagine the pin, instead of being a, instead of being a round pin, imagine it being like a, a long, thin, uh, you know, having a different shape. And then, you know, it's it would be possible to make that type of joint that did uh, make rotation impossible. But as long as that pin is round, which is how we're going to always think about it, it can spin freely. Uh, okay. Um, yes, it makes sense that it's negative because that downward force of gravity would make it rotate. Um, clockwise around that pin, so that's negative. And then the force RB. The row vector is the same. One, zero. And now we have to represent that force vector. By the way, if you drew your force vector going this way, that's fine too. Um, and you'll get the right answer, whichever one of those you choose. You just have to choose one of the two directions that's perpendicular to the slide. Okay, so how are we going to get that? Um, so here's our coordinate system. Here's a vector that's parallel to the slot. There's the vector that we want. This angle is 45 degrees. This angle is 90 degrees. So we get from the positive x axis to this is 45 plus 90 to 135. Um, so the value of theta for that black vector there is 135. And so the force is RB times cosine and sine of 135, which is uh, negative 0.7071 RB, positive 0.7071 RB. And then the cross product is 1 times that minus 0 times that. So you get 0 0.7071 RB. And then the last force is the 10,000 Newton force.
the force vector is zero, negative 10,000. Nope. That's the force vector, not the row vector. Row vector is two zero. The force vector is zero, negative 10,000. Cross product is two times this minus zero times zero. So you get negative 20,000. Um, so Newton's second law, we'll just add up all the things in the force column, set those equal to zero. So RAX, RAY, plus zero, negative 490.5. plus negative 0.7071 RB, positive 0.7071 RB, plus zero, negative 10,000 is equal to zeros. And the moment equation, says negative 490.5 plus 0 0.7071 RB minus 20,000 is equal to zero. So that's three equations for three variables. Uh, The third equation says RB is equal to, uh, I don't have that answer, it's 20,490.5 divided by 0 Okay, Newton's. And then uh, the first equation says RAX is equal to uh, 0 0.7071 times 28978.2. What's that? Okay, and then R A Y is um, 10,490.5 uh, minus 0 0.7071 times 28,978.2. What's that? Four eighty-seven point seven two. These are all the Newtons. Okay, so the external loads on this beam are: uh, we have a force vector over here with a x component of twenty four ninety point five and a y component of eighteen. 487.7. We have a weight force of 490.5. We have a force going this way with a magnitude of 28978.2. And then a downward force of 10,000. And then um, 
we're not going to do this in this class, but when you take D form, uh, now that you have uh, all of the external loads acting on this beam, you can use these external loads to calculate the stresses at each point inside this beam and figure out if there's anywhere on this beam where you're concerned about a fracture starting. Any questions about that one? Okay, there's one more thing I want to talk about. Before we get into 3D joints and that's called equipolent systems. Um, the idea of equipolent systems is in a rigid body, a set of loads can often be replaced by a different set of loads without changing the body's behavior. Um, So the benefit of this to us is that sometimes you can fi find a new set of loads that makes the calculation easier to do than, than the original set. Um, we're not going to do much with this. There's just one that's going to be useful to us. Um, but for example, uh, Any combination of uh, forces and couples acting on a rigid body can be replaced by a force vector at the body's center of mass and a couple vector. Um, there's some kind of problems where that makes the calculation a little easier to do if you replace the original set, which could be 30 different forces and, you know, 20 different couples, and you just replace them all with a single force at the center of mass and a single couple. We're not going to use that one in this class, but that's the idea of an equipolent system of loads. Uh, by the way, Uh, don't write this yet. I'll get back to this in a second. Erase that with your little uh, electronic eraser like that. Um, so the one we're going to use um, is that you can move a force anywhere along what's called its line of action.
without changing the problem. And here's what I mean by the line of action, if that's the body that you're talking about. And at a point here, a force is applied like this. The line of action is the line that's parallel to the force and goes through where the goes through the point where the force is actually applied. So anywhere in space along this dotted line is called the line of action. And so if the calculations are easier to take this force that's really acting here and acting that's acting here, you can just move it there and everything works out the same. And uh, since mathematically, we don't, we never know, like there's nothing in our calculations that um, say where the limits of the body is or are. It doesn't even matter if you put it onto a point that's really on the body. You can take this force and apply it out here, you know, and mathematically everything will come out right, even though, you know, Physically, obviously, you can't apply a force to this thing by applying it there. Um, so now the thing that I want you to notice. Um, keep in mind that this equipotent system thing only works with rigid bodies. And rigid bodies don't really exist. It's a uh, it's a um, simplification that we use. So think about what would happen with a deformable body um, if you had a body like this and you apply a force here, and this body is deformable, the body would deform a certain way because of that force. Right? And that's different than, you know, if this is the line of action, And so now you move that force along the line of action to here. That's going to cause a different type of deformation. You know, it would stretch a little thing out there. So the deformation is going to be different if you move a force along the line of action. But if you're assuming that the bodies are rigid and that no deformation occurs, which is what we're doing in this class, then you can always make that substitution. Yes? Right. That's right. Yep. Yes? So, yeah, that's a good question. So that's what this does is it does change the row vector, but it doesn't change row cross F. Okay, so, so that's the special thing about moving it along the line of action. If you move it anywhere that's not along the line of action, it'll change row cross F and it'll change the problem. Um, so I'll give an example that sort of shows how this works. Okay, so this is like a guy working out 
with the hot new planking craze. He's uh, has his hand around a little handle that's connected to a wheel, and the wheel's pressed up against the wall. He's just holding himself like this. And he's like, I only agreed to this because I thought my girlfriend would think I was cool. Let's say that the mass of this guy is 80 kilograms, and um, his center of mass is somewhere around here. By the way, did you know that the center of mass of an object doesn't have to be in a material point of the object? It makes sense if you think about the center of mass of like an open ring. Obviously, the center of mass of a ring would be right in the center, and there's no material. Did you know that, like, if you're watching high jumping in the Olympics and they do the funny, like, backwards Fosbury flop thing, the world's best, like, good high jumpers, really good high jumpers, get their whole body over the bar and never at one instant is their center of mass higher than the bar? It's pretty cool. Um... And let's say that the height to the roller is 88. And the horizontal distance from the foot to the center of mass is 0.5 meters. And we want to know what are the reactions. Okay, well, um, this is a roller contact. Over here, we're going to treat this as a friction contact. Um, so first let's draw a free body diagram. And the loads that are applied, what kind of load is applied at a friction contact? The friction, yeah, applies a force uh, parallel to the surface, but the normal force is perpendicular to the surface, so you get a full unknown vector of forces. So I'll call that. RA. Then we have a downward force acting somewhere off of the body because the weight is always applied at the center of mass. And uh, this applies a force of 80 times 9.81, so 784.8, I think. And then uh, what kind of force is applied at a roller? Yeah, it's in this case, it's in a known direction. It's going to push on it, um, but it's not going to prevent translation parallel to the surface, and it's not going to prevent rotation. So I'll call this RB. And actually, right here, you can tell whether you have the problem set up in a way that's going to be solvable or not. Most of the time. 
Um, we know we're going to get three equations out of this. So you know you can't have more than three variables to solve for. Here we have one, two, three, so it should work out. Um, and then row, force, moment. We have to choose an about point. I guess I'll choose that here. So for the force RA, uh, there's no row vector. The force is RAX, RAY. Cross product is zero. And now we get to the two forces where we have incomplete information. Notice that uh, we know horizontally where this force is, but we don't know if it's one meter up, half a meter up. We're not given any information about that. Um, but what we're going to do is just take advantage of the fact that we can move this anywhere along the line of action. And so I'm going to move this force down to the ground, okay? And so then the row vector is just equal to 0 0.50. 0. If you move this force location down to the ground, then there's no y component of the vector from the force. Um, and then the force is... 0, negative 784.8. Cross product is this times this minus this times this. So that's 392.4 negative. And now we get to the force RB, this was the weight, now RB, um, what's the row vector for that? Well, we don't know horizontally where that acts, but that doesn't matter again, because we can move this along the line of action, which now it's horizontal, until it's right above And then that row vector is just equal to zero positive point eight. The force is negative RB zero. Cross product is zero times zero minus that times that. And so we get zero point eight RB. Uh, positive because it's, yeah, it's the, these two minus these two, and we already have a negative. Uh, so Newton's second law says R-A-X, R-A-Y, plus zero, negative 784.8. Plus negative R-B, zero is equal to zeros. And the moment equation says negative 392.4 plus 0 0.8 RB is equal to zero. So RB is equal to um, thanks. Oh, makes sense. Four ninety point five. And then what do you get for RA for the components? For Y you get positive seven eighty four point eight. And for X you get four ninety point five.
Any questions about that? Now, I, I want to point out one thing about this. Like, that made this problem a little simpler, maybe. Um, but I want you to notice that even without knowing that thing about the line of action, we still could have done this problem. We would have got the same answer. We would just would have had a couple of other, we would have had to think about it a little bit differently. Um, so we could have, if we didn't move this weight along its line of action, we could have said that it was, that the row vector was uh, 0.5 for x and then like h1, you know, or h to y, then this row vector would have been 0.5h. And look at what would have happened if you would have taken this cross product. This is what you were asking me for. We would have had this times this and h times zero. And so we would have gotten the same thing. And for that force rb, uh, we could have called this horizontal distance from here to there, like L, then this row vector would have been L 0.8. Cross product would be L times zero minus this, and we would have got the exact same thing. But sometimes this simplifies problems a little. OK, any questions about that? Um, let's stop there for now. And next time, uh, I will uh, talk about how to do reduced row echelon form in your calculator, an easy way to solve even big systems of equations. And we'll have some problems later on that have 20 equations and 20 variables. Obviously, like substitution would never, you know, that would be terrible for that. So I'll talk about how to solve bigger systems, and then we'll get into 3D stuff. Yes? Yes, I, uh, I said just before you got here that uh, I just noticed that I had quizzes. I'd totally forgotten about those, so I should get them to you on Tuesday. Okay, yeah.